Good morning, students. This is the class for April the 8th, 2020, uh, for Comparate Due. Uh, yes, I'm recording it a little earlier, so that's why I was checking the date. Um, so we're finally almost done. We're almost at our um, Easter or spring break. Let's go to what we were doing uh, on Monday, see, so we, um, we looked at three different types of text analysis with um, the first one, we, um, okay, the first one, if you remember, was about Dalzil, um, undercover, fox hunting undercover, and we analyzed this text for its speech acts. We looked at the difference between locutionary act the mere utterance of um, uh, the a mere utterance, illocutionary force. What is the social function behind um, an utterance? And finally, perlocutionary effect: the effect that um, an utterance has on the hearers. And so we looked at this te this text and um, um, how to use these different types of acts. Uh, and also the difference between some cases of direct and indirect uh, speech acts that uh, this person was using. Um, then uh, with the second text that we analyzed about Scrabble, we looked at um, the pragmatics of conversation. There was a mom and a daughter that were playing, who were playing uh, Scrabble. And we saw that this text was characterized by lots of interruptions or overlaps. And um, um, and um, in, this, um, in this situation where it's a mom and da daughter um, talking, uh, not always the adjacency pairs were respected, meaning that, for instance, there was the case of the mom that was offering banana bread and uh, the young girl uh, rejects. So not always did an offer um, then have the response of an acceptance. And we looked at several insertions, okay, it was, there was lots of back and forth going on, um, and in pre-sequences and um, insertions. Last one, about visiting Louise, we focused on how to analyze a text um, and by looking at maxims. Were they respected, floated, or violated? And we said that in this case, since Lise and Melvin were very close, they could float the maxims because um, they knew exactly, the other person knew exactly what the speaker was talking about. Okay, and then um, for the videos, we watched something about the Big Bang Theory, um, some parts of the Big Bang Theory and how flat um, maxims were floated in that case, and then the song. Okay, give me a second, just make me, let me save this um, document. Okay. So today we'll continue with section B of your text, um, and we probably might start section C. Because remember that we have not only this book, but also the book on semantics that is a little more difficult, so we need to devote some time to that. What are we going to look at for today? The principle of politeness in this text about imperialism. Um, it is from a lecture on European um, imperialism delivered by this uh, Dr. Smith. Let's see if I can make it a little, give some more contrast there. Didn't help at all. There you go. Many of you here today are not from Africa, but you are, many of you, from parts of the world that have been affected 
by one of the great global forces at work in world history, what we loosely call imperialism. And that is why I thought what I should talk to you about today is the phenomenon of imperialism, not just in terms of the 19th and 20th century, as you will see, not just in terms of the impact of Europe on the non-European world. Because what we are grappling with in the phenomenon of imperialism is a phenomenon that in various forms is as old as the formation of state systems by human beings. So I'm going to, um, at considerable risk um, to myself, try to set this phenomenon in a much wider, um, more global perspective. I hope that you might be of interest to many of you, uh, sorry, I hope, that might, I hope that might be of interest to many of you who have either been subjected to what you consider imperialism or indeed have been part of the states and societies that have themselves been imperialistic or are still being so. I think we have to begin by facing up the fact that today we live in an age of anti-imperialism. All over the world there is a rejection against the Let me see if I'm going to get the wrong letter. against the things we associate with the phenomenon of imperialism, the domination of the weak countries or societies by the strong, the economic exploitation of the natural resources of often poorer countries um, in the world by the rich industrialized parts of the world. Uh, the gross and in many parts of the world, the widening gap in terms of political military and economic powers, and standards of the living between the rich and the poor countries, the belief in one society of the absolute superiority of its culture, its values and its beliefs, and the attempt to impose though these upon the people of other cultures and often of different races. Today, in Europe and America, in the countries of the ex-Soviet Union and in Asia, as well as in all those areas of what used to be called Third World, which were until so recently under European influence or indeed colonial rule, imperialism is regarded as a bad thing. To call someone an imperialist is a term of abuse, like calling him a racist, racist or a fascist. The word imperialism, I think you agree, 
is loaded with emotional and ideological overtones. If I say, for instance, that recently I have been studying and contributing to a new Oxford history of British Empire, which I have, that is a clear, concrete, and perfectly responsible historical subject to study. It was indeed the most powerful and extensive empire in the world history. But if I say I'm studying and writing about the history of British imperialism, that's already a somewhat different thing. The kind of books that are written about uh, that have uh, that are written about it are different too. Okay, so let's see um, what aspect of text analysis, of discourse analysis, your book discusses for this reading. It chose to focus on politeness maxims. As you can see, it's quite a delicate topic, so you understand why it chose to uh, look at politeness for this text. Give me just a second, I need to, to get the plug. So what is this professor, or at least this lecturer, trying to do? Let's look at line 32, where there is the maxim of agreement. Um, no, wait a second, it's not line 32. I saw it, I think, at the beginning of the text. Give me a second. Mm, okay, line six. Okay, um, I should. Uh, where, do, where does it start? And that is what I thought. Um, and that is why I thought uh, what I should try to talk to you about today is the phenomenon of imperialism, not just in terms of the 19th and 20th century, as you will see, not just in terms of the impact of Europe. And okay, so it tries to set the grounds for an agreement with uh, the people, with um, whoever is listening to him with the audience. But we can see this, the maxim of agreement, even more in line number 12. Oh, let me change this a second. This one was line 6. Okay, let's go back there to line 12. So he's talking about the topic of imperialism, and he says, I hope that might be of interest to many of you who have either been subjected to what you consider imperialism, or indeed have been part of the states and societies that have themselves been imperialistic or are still being so. Okay, so he's trying to prepare the grounds for a common agreement with the audience, because he wants to convince them at least to... Um, follow whatever he's saying and probably convince him um, about his theories. Let's see what happens here at lines 10 and 11. So you can see that, especially in this part of the text, there's lots of hesitations, or at least um, pauses. Not necessarily reformulations, but at least pauses. Look at this. So I'm going to, um, at considerable risk um, to myself, 
try to set this phenomenon in a much wider, um, more global perspective. Um, I'm an awful reader, but you can imagine that this person is hesitating. He's probably trying to find the right words to say what he wants to say without being indelicate. The topic is very uh, tricky, let's say, so or at least delicate. And what he's doing here is he's respecting the maxim of generosity. He's putting himself. He's giving most of the cost to himself. He's risking and giving maximum benefit to the audience. It's not an easy topic to talk about, remember. He is risking his face. Hmm? He's trying to respect the other pre the audience's negative face. Okay? He's hesitating a lot and trying to give lots of hedging because he wants to um, allow the audience to have their own ideas. He wants to apparently respect their own independence and their own independent idea about imperialism. But at the same time, he is doing a face-threatening act. So he has to find a way to um, establish a contact with the, with the audience without... Um, I mean, without destroying their uh, face completely. Okay. So. So that is, uh, that is the end of section B. Now, before we get into, um, oh, okay, before we get into section C, exploration for your pragmatics book, I want to say something both in Italian and in English. I'll start from Italian, because it has to be clear for your exam. In class, io Um, per la sezione C ho fatto un paio di queste analisi in classe, sono più come un dibattito um, dove c'è un testo e vi sono delle domande che riguardano sia uh, che riguardano la text analysis, the, the discourse analysis. Uh, alcuni di questi testi um, li saltavo in classe e li facevo eh, preparare agli studenti come una sorta di portfolio eh, per l'esame. Che cosa significa? C'era una gamma mh, eh, di una rosa di, se non mi sbaglio, sui 10, eh, 10 testi, 15 testi, non ricordo molto bene, eh, che poi chiedevo agli studenti in sede d'esame. Che cosa significa? Che io eh, davo a caso uno di questi testi da analizzare eh, poco prima dell'esame. Dell cioè gli studenti entravano nello studio, davo loro uno di questi testi che avevano già studiato a casa eh, e chiedevo loro di prendere degli appunti eh, e poi avremmo discusso dell'analisi di questo testo durante eh, l'esame, dopo la parte teorica. Farò lo stesso eh, anche quest'anno eh, e vedrete che nelle prossime slide ci sono alcuni testi eh, che sono evidenziati in verde e sono quelli che vi chiederò di fare da soli. Quelli invece eh, evidenziati in rosa sono quelli che guarderemo insieme, che analizzeremo insieme durante le lezioni e per alcune di queste eh, ci sono alcune domande che magari vi chiederò uh, di rispondere, a cui vi chiederò di rispondere nel comment box del video stesso. Ripeto, ci sono questi testi, 
con il titolo ed evidenziato in verde. Sono quelli che non affronterò durante le video lezioni, ma vi chiederò di prepararli da soli in, a casa. E eh, in sede d'esame, la prima cosa che farete quando vi siederete è di eh, io vi darò uno di questi testi e vi chiederò di prendere gli appunti e di analizzarlo. Quando verrete a discutere con me in sede d'esame, vi chiederò di analizzare uno di quei testi che decido io al momento. Ok? Se non è chiaro, poi mi mandate una mail e ne riparliamo. Lo ripeto di nuovo. Invece, per la parte in inglese, perché ci sono anche gli Erasmus, so, as for this part, you're going to see that some texts are highlighted in green and some are pink. We are going to do the pink ones together, but um, I'll ask you to do the parts, do the text that are highlighted in green on your own, because when, uh, when you'll come for your exam, I will ask you, I will randomly pick one of these, I think there are 10, 15 texts, and I'll randomly pick one of them, and the first part of your exam is going to be to analyze this text, to take some notes, and then we'll discuss about this, uh, we'll talk about your analysis together before we start, well, actually, after we do the theoretical part of the exam. The question that I will ask you during the exam is, okay, great, so based on what you've studied, please analyze this text for me. With that said, we'll start section C, and it starts with um, one of these texts that is highlighted in pink, so we'll do it together. This first one is about making an assumption on the reader's background knowledge. The text that we're going to analyze is quarterbacking is an imperfect art. This is uh, an Associated Press football news flash from, by, written by Dave Goldberg. You're going to notice that this text is uh, for a U.S. discourse community of football fans. As you can see, it's a very short, um, it's a very short paragraph. Sorry. Uh, and I'll read it first. Peyton Manning threw three interceptions, the most he's had in a game since his rookie year. Brett Favre threw three interceptions and fumbled twice. And Mark Brunel fumbled four snaps, losing two, and three and threw interceptions on consecutive possessions before being pulled. Yes, even the best of NFL quarterbacks can have off days. And when they do, their team lose, as the Colts, Packers, and Jaguars did Sunday. There was no bright side, Brunel said after the Jaguars. Uh, after the Jaguars fell three games and a tiebreaker behind Baltimore in the AFC Central. I did not understand a single word of what they're saying. And that, I think, is something that is common to you too. You see that um, the first impression, the first thing that you can tell me is that this is definitely for a specific discourse community. The discourse community it refers to is U.S. football. If you're not into U.S. football, you are definitely not going to understand any single word about this. Or maybe, at least, most of it. Probably we all know the word quarterback. We know that it's a sort of, um, that it's a role that is uh, used in, um, in football, but not more than that. Okay. If you don't know the technical terms, you do not understand this text. And so probably from there you can tell me about um, the different types of context, for instance. 
Um, no, we looked at social context, um, interpersonal context, cultural context, and the role that this has in texts. Um, or, uh, probably you can tell me something about anaphoric reference or cataphoric reference, looking at the first line where he says, the most he's had in a game since rookie year, that is referring to Peyton Manning. Okay. This is, of course, a very short um, and intricate paragraph, so it's not very easy to find other things to refer to. But with longer texts, you'll definitely find a little bit of everything, of all the things that you've studied during the first part of this book. So let's look at some of the questions that it offers anyway. Um, so this text makes no concessions to those um, to those who do not understand the reference of the specialist vocabulary in the in-group terms. Why do you think this is so? Okay, and uh, the second reflection could be on find another sports news text, preferably not about football, and compare the density of the specialist words in your text with the density in the football text. What do you think is the main influence on the density of specialist terms? The size of the discourse community that follows the sport, the place where the text is published, or something else? Okay, this is just some food for thought and you can reply um, in the comment box. Um, during your exam, I am not going to ask you this type of questions. I'm not going to ask you the questions that, are, um, that you see over here. I'm just going to ask you to analyze uh, the text, okay, depending on what you've studied. This is just to get into a conversation, a general conversation. The first text that you are going to analyze on your own is called Cookery Class, Unbaked Chocolate Cake. It is a text from BBC Two um, on uh, the title of the, the program is Delia's How to Cook, A Guide to All Things Chocolate. Okay. Um, and as you will analyze on your own, uh, this type of text assumes very little knowledge of the art of cooking. Okay, so you have this text um, during the in in the video, but uh, I will always also put them on Moodle, and I will create a separate file. Um, yes, I will create a separate file with uh, all the text that you are supposed to analyze on your own. Okay. The text, I will read these questions just to show you some of the examples of what you could analyze. Okay, but again, I'm not going to ask these questions during the exam. For instance, out of all the referring expressions, roughly what proportion have exophoric reference and what proportion contain deixis? How much have you lost by reading the script as opposed to actually seeing the TV program. Okay, so probably you can give me some examples about endophoric reference and exophoric reference. Um, another comment could be on this. How explicit is the language? Are there any parts that you would rewrite in a less explicit way if you were to aim at an audience of more experienced cooks? So how basic is the language and how would you rewrite the text if you were to have an experienced um, audience? Okay. 
Okay, so this text is for you and you will be asked to analyze it based on what you've studied. And that's text number one for you. Now, as you can see, this one is in pink. This means that we will analyze it in class. And uh, the title is T.S. Eliot's Nobel Prize. It, um, the excerpt comes from the Castle Dictionaries, Dictionary of Anandokis uh, by Nigel Rees, 1999. When it was announced that T.S. Eliot had been awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1948, he was making a lecture tour of the United States. A Midwestern reporter asked him if he had been given the prize for his great work, for his great work, The Wasteland. No, replied Eliot, I believe I have been given it in recognition of my whole corpus. Accordingly, the journalist wrote, in an interview with the, our airport correspondent this morning, Mr. Eliot revealed that the Swedish Academy had given him the Nobel Prize, not for the wasteland, but for his poem, My Whole Corpse. Okay, take a second to a minute to read this on your own. What you see here clearly is that there is a breakdown in communication. This happens because the speaker implies one thing and the hearer infers another. So what happened here is that the journalist thought that my whole corpus was, was a poem. Okay, So that's where the breakdown in communication happens. So if you had to do this for your own exam, if you had to analyze this text for your exam, probably you could tell me something about background knowledge. Okay, so probably, well, not very, actually, truly, uh, the, the journalist had little, if not, inform not um, any um, information about this writer. He thought that there was a poem named My Whole Corpus. Probably this person did not even know the word corpus. Okay, so there's some background knowledge that is missing there on the part of the journalist. Plus, um, your text also has this other question. Would you agree that this humorous piece of writing invites readers to share the attitude of the writer and laugh at those who know less than him? Or do you think the humor lies in something more complex than this? To what extent is this typical of jokes and endokies and comedy in general? Can you think of any other examples? So basically, do you think that the writer wanted to make fun of this person? Or is there something more to that than just a simple misunderstanding? Rhetorical question. But you can see if you can come up with any examples of this lack of, um, of this misunderstanding, uh, lack of communication. Okay, we'll go back to this 
link in a while. Actually, just let me move it somewhere else. Okay, so when I ask you to analyze this type of text during the exam, I want to know, I don't know, anaphoric, cataphoric reference, um, if you find cases of uh, politeness and how politeness strategies are used, um, what else? Um, what are the cohesion techniques that are used? Substitution, ellipsis, um, repetition, all this type of things is what I want you for when you analyze these type of texts. The second text that I want you to do on your own is uh, about Elizabeth and Darcy declare their love, okay, from Austin's Pride and Prejudice. In this part, in the paragraph that you are going to read, Elizabeth has loved Darcy for a long time, but she hadn't declared her love because she thought that Darcy had been cruel with her sister's fiancé. When she discovers that he had actually helped his sister with their financial problems, she eventually declares her love. Okay, so on your own, you will read this, this, mm, this text and then analyze it during the exam based on what you studied. Okay. As you can see, this one is a pretty long one. And uh, some of the questions, some of the clues that your text gives you are um, that uh, this text is based on interpersonal context. Uh, and it asks you to find some examples of intertextuality or how they are expressed. We have said that people who are close make vague and implicit reference to entities and events in their interpersonal context. Is this true of Elizabeth and Darcy? Why or why not? Okay, so this gives you an idea about what you have to look for in the text. Probably you have to tell me something about interpersonal context and what is implicit or explicit in the text. Okay, or do they have a shared attitude to conventions in their common social cultural context? Okay, remember that here, this type, especially with Austin, context, cultural context means a lot. Okay, and now um, last text that we're going to look at this time together, you see it's highlighted in pink, um, shark takes leg, sorry, give me a second. Investigating co-text cohesion. Shark takes leg from the newspaper, um, Sydney Morning Herald from 2000, the year 2000. The patrons at the Blue Duck Cafe overlooking Perth's Cottleslow Beach were drinking coffee and having breakfast as the early morning swimmers splashed out just offshore. Kim Gamble, Kim Gamble owner of the cafe, a favorite spot of the city's business and political elite, was doing his paperwork on the balcony. Suddenly, 
as he and his customers watched in, her in horror, a five-meter white pointer shark plowed into a group of swimmers, tearing one man's leg off and leaving him to die, and then chasing one of his companions towards the beach. From the balcony, I could see this huge shark. It was really huge, a shaken Mr. Gambler said soon after the attack. There was a whole sea of blood, and it was pulling the person. Wow. So, since your text, your text suggests, the text contains synonyms and anaphoric reference. Where are they and why are they necessary? Let's go back to the text. From the balcony, I could see this huge shark. It was really huge. Or... Um, Mr. Gambler and his and his customers. Or let's see if we can find something about the shark. Let's see. A five meter white pointer shark. And then this huge shark. And several other cases of synonym of um, of anaphoric reference. So probably you could tell me why he uses all this anaphoric reference, okay, to create cohesion within the text, of course. Um, and then he uses shark huge shark and a five meter white pointer shark okay, to give further descriptions about uh, about the shark and then notice this whole sea of blood probably you can tell me something about this why do they use this metaphor and Look at, for instance, the whole overall pattern of the text, okay? So there's an introduction, the description of the subject who is going to talk, and then there's a sudden change. Why does this person use direct speech in certain parts? Okay, what is the purpose? Why do you use direct speech? And uh, things like this that are definitely, there are definitely more things to see in a longer text like the ones that I'm asking you to complete uh, on your own. Um, last thing I want you to do for today is uh, we're going to watch this video together uh, about how to speak so that people want to listen. Uh, the video is about 10 minutes and it's about the um, about persuasion and language and I don't know probably can help you um, use language better or be a little more uh, conscious of how language is used with you so please pause the video now and watch this other video over here Hope you enjoyed that and now um, let's move on to the last part of our class uh, and um, the song that you gave me for today is unstoppable you make the words a little bigger okay all smile all smiles i know what it takes to fool this town i'll do it till the sun goes down and all through the night time. I'll tell you what you want to hear. Leave my sunglasses on while I shed a tear. It's never the right time. I put my armor on, show, how, how, show you how strong I am. I put my armor on and show you that I am. I am unstoppable. I'm uh, a Porsche. Um, I think I heard pusher, but I'm a Porsche with no brakes. Uh, I'm invincible. Yeah, I win every single game. 
I'm so powerful. I don't need batteries to play. I'm so confident. I'm unstoppable today. I'm unstoppable today. Break down. Only alone I will cry out now. You'll never see what's hiding out. Hiding out deep down. I know. I've heard that you let your feelings show is the only way to make friendships grow. But I'm too afraid now. I put my armor on, show you how strong I am. I put my armor on, I'll show you that I am unstoppable. I'm a Porsche with no brakes. I'm invincible. Yeah, I win every single game. I'm so powerful. I don't need batteries to play. I'm so confident. I'm unstoppable today. It repeats and it repeats. Okay, so you have the um, the link to the video right here and in the comment box. Uh, since this is the class for uh, April the 8th, um, we'll be back after the Easter or spring break, however you prefer. Um, so I hope that you can take a break during this couple of days. Um, enjoy time with your family and friends, even if uh, this means that they are not physically with you. But uh, we have all these online sources that help us do this. And, um, well, um, buona Pasqua o buona pausa di primavera come preferite. E noi ci rivediamo uh, il lunedì successivo alla Pasqua e alla Pasquetta che è il 20 aprile, ok? Take care, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye.